you, yeah, so like we are now, that you're kind of, oh, there's nobody with us yet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Karen yeah, having yeah. those conversations, you know, yeah. absolutely. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, over to you. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, I suppose this is being recorded, so we can just begin, right? Yeah, I, I would. I, yeah, let's yeah. start because this is this is the amusing bit where someone comes to watch the recording and go, "Did they know they were being recorded?" You know, <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> well, well I, I prepared a little introductory thing, so let me let me let's let me kick off. Me. No problem. Great, thank um, you. I will say good morning and afternoon and evening to everyone joining in or indeed watching the recording today. I'm very pleased and excited to bid you a warm welcome to this panel at the Horasis Conference. Uh, my name is Errol, and I'll be hosting you for this 30 to 45 minute, what is now a fireside chat. Uh, and I was going to, of course, ask your forgiveness for the change in the schedule, uh, the unforeseen uh, circumstances. This was originally a panel of four. It's now become what I would hope is a dynamic duo. And I think this may be a great benefit uh, to have a nice intellectual dance with Mr. Stewart Hatton. Um, so the panel will therefore be free-flowing, relatively unstructured. The topic we shall be collectively engaging with today concerns ideas that attract entrepreneurs to work on them. So entrepreneurship, of course, is an inherently multidisciplinary set of actions. And so our discussion today will flow in that spirit. Uh, similarly, I think it's important to consider the individual sort of holistically, uh, especially given our topic today about the entrepreneur. So in, in, in our short conversations leading up to this panel, and indeed, at the beginning of this recording, I realized an introduction in purely professional terms would be unjust. Uh, his energy, curiosity, and knowledgeable engagement with and across a wide range of subjects transcends such a categorical limitation. Uh, so, you know, you know, welcome, Stuart. Thank you uh, to bring, for bringing your energy onto this panel. Uh, but I will, of course, do you justice uh, into your day-to-day -day activities and introduce you as the CIO of the firm Simply Ethical. Uh, Stuart provides Sharia compliant and socially responsible investment solutions. Uh, the aim of, of uh, such capital allocation is to achieve positive social impact without a compromise on your financial goals. So um, thank you. A bit of housekeeping as well for those of you who joined. Uh, following a bit of back and forth between Stuart and I, I will open the floor to a Q&A as needed. So it is my first time using the platform, so you know, do excuse me if there are any hiccups. However, please do request to share or indeed write your question in an available chat box, and I will pose these to Stuart. So I think, yeah, in that spirit, uh, I think it's important to think about, you know, if it, as, a, as a panel, uh, this is something that I'm very passionate about. It's holistic thinking. So the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. This is the kind of uh, you know philosophy that I've engaged with uh, in, my, in, my, in my studies and also in previous panels. And so I think a panel is quite unique in that respect and kind of bringing something. Something emerges when people come into a room together. And I suppose we are in a collective room now. We've cr created a little closed loop system. And so uh, with that with that spirit, I encourage everyone who's now joining us to engage with us, to write into the comments section. And um, of course, um, to make this something greater than just the two of us here today. <laughs> so, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'll pose you this question. Just maybe we can start with a bit of an introduction for yourself and a bit of a free association on what attracts entrepreneurs uh, to mm. to do the things they do. Well, th thank you, Errol. And uh, and uh, at some point, you being just the I like I like the, the dynamic duo. We've I think we've <laughs> even got the same color shirt on. We really oh, yeah. have. Kind of, we really tuned in together, haven't we? Um, at some point, do give a little bit of background, of kind of where you've come from as well. Because I think when it's kind of in this situation, it'd be nice to hear kind of from your background. It, you're absolutely right. So this is this is a really interesting opportunity to talk about a very broad topic and one of the key factors about this broadness of this topic is that you know we're talking about you know what attracts entrepreneurs to the kind of ideas that really get them kind of flowing and i think we need to go back to kind of what i call almost like human characteristics around the kind of the energy and the motivation that people need to kind of make them get up in the morning it's the kind of uh, you know what makes you get up uh, you know on a monday morning um, and makes you think about what you want to achieve is you're kind of growing your business or growing other people's business, how you're getting involved. I mean, my background is very varied and um, I'm, you know, I'm, I am uh, have a number of different businesses and foundations. And the reason I do so much is that I want to keep a level of interest going. I think entrepreneurs you know, are very, very good at being able to um, focus on, how do I put it, I suppose, focus on getting the task done that's needed but also being able to kind of give what I call a, a much broader helicopter view, an overall view of what needs to be achieved and done and which kind of direction we're going on. You know, when you sit into the driving seat of a car and you're on the road and you're going, one of the difficulties is, is that you know, your, your, your focus becomes more and more kind of uh, narrowed. And it's, it's really important that actually as an entrepreneur, you start to kind of recognize that actually sometimes it's, sometimes it's good to sit in the back seat. 
Um, I prefer being tied to the roof. Okay, the wind in my hair. I haven't got that much hair, but, you know, I've got enough to make it flow. And see the 360, what's going on. You know, um, and what's quite nice also is if you're going fast enough, they can't hear me screaming. So I think on that basis, it's about being able to make noise that sometimes doesn't necessarily translate and kind of confuse or obfuscate the actual person and what they're doing. So it's an odd analogy, but the reason I've used it is I think it's about the drive and the motivation that gets people going forward. And I think that's what's really exciting about a topic like this. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that's picked up on is about uh, how people feel about this. So I have a little thing that I kind of a little kind of uh, thing I live by, which I think is um, what really counts is not it's not how you it's not what you do for somebody or what you say to somebody. It's how you make them feel. And I think, you know, when you're in business or when you're in uh, work with somebody or if you're if, if you're sitting on a panel like this, you know, one of the key factors here is about what you say may affect the way someone thinks, but you've got to think about how they feel as well. And you've got to have that, what I call emotional kind of perspective. And the emotional intelligence that kind of brought in line with that means that it allows someone to understand clearer what the objectives of that person are when they're having those kind of discussions. So that what I call, well, I think we talked about the kind of gut feeling, you know, that kind of really, really is important. Um, I know that um, uh, one of the listeners here is uh, Maria Matloub, and I don't know, I'm, Maria's here for a very short period of time. Um, and I, I, I said, if she wants to kind of jump on and offer a, a few minutes view, because I think she, She's uh, she's got to dash out to another meeting where she is. If you want to come in, have a give us a two or three minutes. Uh, grab the mic, and Errol will, I'm sure, let you in. But uh, before we kind of you know that happens, um, one of the things that I enjoyed um, the work I did. Er, Maria and I worked together um, as uh, co-founders of an organisation called Other Dots Foundation with a gentleman called Peter Lazou as well. And one of the things that has been really refreshing working with them is that you do kind of go with what you call your gut feeling. And I think we are often in danger today of using so much of this to try and identify what is a fundamental analysis to get things right. And if you don't get it right, you then go back and reanalyze it and overanalyze and then you kind of end up kind of taking what I call advice. And sometimes it's really important to kind of get what I call that emotional attachment and actually understand what it means and then use that gut feeling to actually bring something forward. It often saves you as well. I'd like to think. I mean, I don't know whether that's going to be something that people can rely upon all the time. But just sometimes you sit there and go, I'm not 100 percent sure about this. Why is that? Maybe I pause. You know, and that, that's important as well. You know, so it gives, it gives a little bit of a kind of a, a top level kind of insight into that broad perspective. That was incredible. And that's really great, actually, because uh, you've triggered a, a bunch of thoughts now. I think I think one mm -hmm. thing that really jumped out to my mind was what you ended on there, which is the kind of role of emotion. Uh, in decision making, you actually asked me as well, and quite rightly, to give a bit of background. So I, 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 I yeah, yeah, so, uh, just uh, because it's related, of course. So my my master's degree, um, uh, which is something that I suppose what I'm bringing into this um, into this panel, uh, was in, in psychological sciences, and I particularly researched the role of emotion in investment decision making. So uh, of, of, often in in economic theory, especially in academic economic theory, we we have the kind of neoclassical economics, which uh, fuels most of the financial models. Particularly, I think what comes to mind is the capital asset pricing model and its use in discount of cash flow analysis to, 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 and the, to kind of pr provide this analytical security to predict the future. Mm. And what you said there was this kind of uh, reliance on over and like over analyzing to deal with uncertainty. So th that's kind of a little bit of academic background. But what, what jumps to my mind here and what's what I'm particularly interested in is embodied cognition. So, you know, what you're talking about um, this, how do I feel about this decision before mm. I make it? Um, that's really powerful. That's something that's really interesting, and it's not something that is taught at all um, in, in in universities or in educational backgrounds or in academia by by any sense of the imagination. But it's something that is acquired over years of practice. Uh, yeah. So that 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 seems to be what our current kind of way of of dealing with things. Um, so I wonder, you know, what jumps to mind now is I was reading George Soros, uh, a book by George Soros, it was uh, the Alchemy of Finance, and he talks mm -hmm. in that book. He writes specifically about when he has back pain, he doesn't make a decision. It's kind of, it's very interesting. He, he, he's, he's thinking about making an investment decision and he says, I have back pain. And this is kind of a somatic marker uh, mm -hmm. about I have, I'm uneasy about something I'm about to do. And mm -hmm. this in itself can be data, right? Uh, I, use, I use George Soros as just an example, but there's, there's actually, you know, in, there's a very interesting kind of idea called the somatic marker hypothesis. But, the, the, you know, I don't want to get too, too deep into that. But the, the idea is that we can listen to our bodies uh, when making 
when making decisions. Mm. You know, the analytical quantification of the world is only one element. And mm. I think then the reason bringing it back to entrepreneurship, uh, I wonder what do, what do you think about this? Are entrepreneurs as individuals, as characters, uh, more likely to be emotionally engaged in the decision? This comes back to what we were talking about earlier as well. Um, the starter versus manager here. Yeah. Right. You know, are the person are, is the personality trait of the entrepreneur one that is more emotionally sort of embodied, emotionally engaged, mm. attracted. You know, it's funny that the, 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 the panel is attracted to ideas, right? Rather, mm. than, uh, rather than a more um, sort of cognitive uh, metaphor. Mm. It's, it's a very physical metaphor. I'm attracted yeah. to something, right? Yeah. Um, whereas I, I wonder then maybe on the investor side, if there's, uh, you know, is there more of a tendency to be more analytical? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, we, we when as an investment manager, so as, as you explain my background, I, you know, I have a, um, a conventional wealth management business, and also I'm the chief investment officer uh, for a, um, a, a very wide, varied Sharia compliant investment business as well. And you know, when you're in front of a client, when you're dealing with investment management, or whether you're dealing with kind of giving financial advice generally, or in terms of entrepreneurial focus, you're giving business advice. You you talk always about taking the emotions off the table, you know. Um, the, the easiest way to describe this is to consider the emotional roller coaster that follows the client when in a investing in the stock market. I and mean, this is the kind of simplified view on this, where you have this kind of uh, this roller coaster point of where you have this kind of highs and lows, and you have this kind of grieving process, this fear, anxiety, you have this kind of elation, all these different perspectives that actually affect the way people feel about their investments. You know, and as an investment manager or advisor or financial wealth manager, you kind of sit in front of them and say, you need to take all the emotions off the table. You know, no emotions here, because this is about, you know, a fundamental analysis of investing in a business and you need to do it this and then. And you kind of have this kind of these pinpoints and you just do this focus around it. And you you drive this, what I call as process. And you, you know, what I've learned over time is you can't do that. Now, the client sits there in front of me now and says, I'm worried about what's happening in Ukraine. And I say to them, no, don't worry about that as far as investments go. Let's just carry on fine. Let's find some good quality companies to invest in. And in 10 years or 15 years time, they will provide quality dividends that you'll be able to retire on. And they kind of go, do you know what? I'm still worried about Ukraine. What, what about nuclear war? You know, I have this bizarre concept. I had a conversation with a client. I, I still kind of makes me laugh when I see this. Where they ran up and said, what if, you know, what if Putin sent a whole load of nuclear weapons over here and, you know, and explain, you know, you know, over the UK and uh, I'm based in the UK. So, you know, we're not far. I actually live up, as the crow flies about a mile away from government's communication headquarters. So there's this kind of idea process that even though I'm nothing to do with that, by the way, uh, though they probably are listening in. Um, hi, guys, if you are. Um, but the whole point is that, you know, the, that would be a target. It's even shaped like a donut. So, you know, crack is shaped like a target, you know. Mm -hmm. And people say, you know, what's going to happen? I'm going, why are you asking that question? Would be vaporized. But what would happen to my investments? Does it really matter? <laughs> Does it? I mean, what, what point? At what point do we take? You know, this huge emotional factor. And so, so but what I've said to clients now is actually, you know what? You've got absolute right to be anxious about situations. You've got absolute right to be worried about what's going on in the world. You've got absolute right to worry about how that may affect your investments. And then let me explain what we do. Because if I reacted the same way as you did, I would end up probably selling out your investments when they're low and buying them back when they're high again and losing you money hands over the fist all the time. Whereas actually we understand the principles and philosophy of investing is about you know, buying, holding, reviewing long term high quality investments, whether it be equities, bonds, property, whatever it might be, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then all the diversification aspects that come into it. But the key thing here is, is this this focus of that you can't just grab in and pull out their hearts. You know, you can't take the emotion out of this. So we need to learn to manage that. Now, entrepreneurs are exactly the same thing, you know, on that basis. You know, and entrepreneurs, when, you know, when, when they get an idea, the idea isn't one of, uh, how many entrepreneurs, if, uh, Ragnar, you're, you're sitting listening to this and you probably have, a, you know, some focus on this idea. And anybody who listens to the recording, how many of you sit there going, you know, actually, this is a great idea. I'm going to make a, a great, you know, EBITDA, a great load of profit. What normally happens, they've got a great idea because it's providing a solution to a problem or it's an idea because it's a product that everyone needs or kind of needs or they don't know their need yet. But by God, one day they're going to love it, you know, which is what I call the iPad theory. When iPads came out, we were saying, I went, oh, I've, got, I've got an iPhone. Uh, I've got a laptop. I don't need an iPad. This, this kind of sits in between. Some, I don't need an iPad. And now I probably spend as much time on iPad as I do any other instrument. <laughs> 
because yeah. it's so functional. So entrepreneurs, you know, need to have actually, they, they must buy into this kind of what, you, what the title says, you know, attractiveness and understanding that actually what it means to them. Now, this kind of brings up another aspect is that not every idea is going to be attractive to every entrepreneur. You know, and I'm one of these people that I um, I don't know whether you've heard it but in the in the UK. You know, we've got this what's the Dragon's Den and they have it in the US or there. You know, and I'm I'm <laughs> how good an entrepreneur am I? I sit there in Dragon's Den, you know, watching Dragon's Den, going, oh, I like that, oh, I like that, oh, I like that. <laughs> Probably 99% of the time, I think it's brilliant the idea because they come across. Unfortunately, they let themselves down often because they haven't got the financial figures or whatever it might be. They're not prepared or the dragons who have probably, um, uh, well, they're better on TV than I would be maybe, but you know, maybe that's what I should aim for, Errol. Yes, yes, I, mean, I, think, I think we've just found it. Yeah, I think we just found I've it. I've just found my vocation. I'm going to become a dragon. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the whole point here is that, you know, when I sit with, I, I watch that as a helicopter viewer, I, I can see the passion and attractiveness why these predominantly entrepreneurs are coming forward into that room. And, and it's usually, say, preparation or, and sometimes the dragons do sit there and go, well, actually, you know, it's, they, they don't often not invest because they don't like the idea. It's usually because they don't necessarily think it's an investable idea or there's a, you know, they haven't really thought the problems through and they haven't got the finances or they haven't, you know, or they don't actually like the person, which is often the case. So, again, you've got this massive emotional bubble that is sitting within. And so when an entrepreneur comes up with an idea or sees an idea, the attractiveness is about this is something that could make money because it's going to provide a solution. It's going to provide a way forward. And that often comes about because we have a set of problems or because we found a better way of working. It doesn't necessarily align with just to make more money because actually the bottom line nowadays is that people want to develop um, entrepreneurial ideas more around the impacts they make. So, you know, environmental or social impact. And people now start to understand that if you start doing something that's good, and that's something that's worthy, and that is a, attractive to both uh, the entrepreneurs, but also in, in terms of the you know the, the people you're aiming to target, your audience, your your customer. Um, actually, do you know what? You'll make money, and unless you really do really badly in the math somewhere. You will make money. So I think the whole key thing about this is saying, okay, this is going back to this whole you know emotional kind of perspective. Of this is that saying. Don't, don't try and take emotions out of investing. Don't try and take it out of the decision-making process. Use it to your advantage, you know. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, we will become very, very boring people, believe me. You know, um, it will become tedious. And actually, the kind of companies you start investing in, they might make some money, but they're not going to be solving the world's problems, are they? Great. This is really, really, really interesting because there, there are three, three points, three points that really jumped to my mind there. One, one was about, you know, you mentioned emotional regulation, which I think is critical. And, mm. and particularly, I think then um, relationships come to mind. Relationships are probably one of the greatest ways that we can emotionally regulate ourselves, but also find meaning in yes. everything that we do, right? Both in our personal lives and of course, in business as well. So mm. I think um, then that leads to a question of, you know, um, once the entrepreneur is attracted to a project, what allows it to be? What what, what allows mm. uh, allows it to continue over time? And my suspicion is that relationships have a big role in that, right? Both between the investor and the entrepreneur, uh, and the entrepreneur and their um, and their team. So maybe there's something, some reflection there. And, and their that. customer, and their customer, even, even almost more importantly, some way their customer. Because I think you're right. I think there's a. Um, you know, emotion is 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 not two dimensional. Emo- emotional relationships aren't two dimensional as well. You know, there are days where you'll get on with people better than other days as well. It's a highly complex kind of environment to live and work in. And I'm sure you know anybody listeners will have worked in uh, environments where they feel uncomfortable or they don't get on with somebody. Um, I- I've been really lucky in my life that I don't think I've ever been in a position where I felt I cannot work this person, I cannot be in the same room as them. But I've seen it happen where I've managed people and I've had people come to me saying, I can't even be near that person. I can't stand them. And I'm going, no, right? <laughs> no, I don't have a problem. You're particularly yeah. sociable, of course, Stuart. So I have no, I have no, no doubts. No doubt. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. But, 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 that, but that's not necessarily the solution, I suppose. That, that, that can be a, a, a cover-up. That that's can be brushing it under the rug. You know, my, my danger, you know, just to kind of put a bit of a personal kind of mm. uh, taint in this, is that actually sometimes, you know, I think, well, we'll work it out. There's always a solution. There's always that's a solution. Problem. And actually sometimes there isn't. You know, there isn't a, a solution to that problem. We need to kind of be a bit more, um, a bit more 
kind of approach it from a different angle, a different way. But anyway, so I, I did interrupt you. So please yeah, go. That was, that's exactly. That's beautiful. Thank you. you know, that was really, really great to understand and get insight on that because, mm. um, yeah, relationships, you know, because your point about emotional regulation made me think, okay, relationships are critical. Of course, you know, thinking mm. about relationships, it could also be about the individual and the collective, right? The entrepreneur is, is in some ways a, a bridge between the individual and the collective. Mm. Many ways, there's an individual idea, there's an there's an object in some ways, a fascination that this entrepreneur has been attracted to. And now, how am I going to bridge this to the collective? That in turn leads to questions about motivation. So you mentioned the SDGs, you mentioned well, maybe indirectly the SDGs, but impact more generally. Um, yeah. You know, that made me think about meaning making, right? Yes. So you know, what is a motivator? You can mo be motivated by money, perhaps to a certain extent, but I think you know, I suspect that dries up pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, probably there's something deeper than that, which is a sense of meaning. There's a sense mm -hmm. of I'm doing something meaningful. Again, mm -hmm. potentially I'm bringing my own biases into the situation. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious what you think here is, mm -hmm. you know, meaning making and the relationship between the individual, namely the entrepreneur and the mm -hmm. idea and the collective, the customer, the society mm -hmm. in which this idea and the subsequent venture is embedded. You know, mm -hmm. how, yes. how, how, how is that? How, what are the, you know, what's going on there, <laughs> perhaps, you know, there's something interesting going on there. And I wonder if you've had any experience of potentially, you know, either resting uh, as an as in your capacity as an asset manager into venture capital deals or into private in, in terms of private equity. And, and maybe you have some stories about, you know, individuals who have started a venture, uh, but they were not maybe self-reflective enough or emotionally intelligent enough to follow mm -hmm. it through because they haven't necessarily thought about the, the meaning of what they're doing or, or indeed the kind of they weren't emotionally engaged in it they weren't embodied in the action you know um, i hope yeah i hope that kind of yeah i, I mean on a, on a more kind of generic basis i think you know one of the, the answers to that is to make sure that you know you, you have the ability to you know, not be alone and 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 be with people that you can start to complement with and understand kind of better with you know um stories are always a good way of telling things i think and you know um, i i can remember I'll start with a personal one, actually. You know, I can remember when I first came into kind of wealth and asset management, you know, to, to, to sign up a client, you know, and that client to open an investment account, you know, write that check out was like, you know, I just used to walk out that front door, kind of back down to my car and go, woo -hoo! You know, I was I'd be jumping up there. People would be thinking, yeah, is he won the, you know, what's, he, what's happening? Is he won the lottery or something? You know, I, I would be just so excited that I had got the client to agree to sign up and to invest. And then, you know, I kind of over time, it, you know, and this would be really small sums of money. I'm talking, you know, just thousands of pounds, but, you know, small sums. Of, and then I realized over time that that actually it wasn't about me. It wasn't about my feelings. The client was doing it because they understood the benefit to them. And I'd actually explained it well. And, you know, I, and, I, and I think we've kind of, you know, prior to this conversation, had I explained that I, I very much make um, the information I often try and create is relatable to the client. And I often do that by sharing sometimes quite intimate details of kind of, you know, m um, my own family or um, friends and, and to, to, to build and bridge those relationships with clients. And this is not a, a sales fad because clients then see your if you if you make yourself a little bit vulnerable, if you kind of, you know, as a, as a businessman makes it a little bit vulnerable again, you know, one of those things that Average person go, oh, you mustn't be vulnerable. You need to be strong and fierce, and that's you know, and you must go in and and you know you've got to be, you know, a, a bit of a bastard. You know, you've got to kind of go in there, and and that's how you win business. And you realise actually this doesn't work these days. Maybe in the nineteen seventies, that's how people did business, but it doesn't mean they were still that's the best way and most successful way of doing it. You realise now actually you need to actually be more complementary, and you need to be understanding and sympathetic and empathetic and you know business and cultures changed over the last 50 years and you know i think it's it suited me more now than it would have done 50 years ago 50 years ago i think i would have struggled to be someone who was prepared to either invest in or to actually be uh for me to be the investor and um, and it, what is interesting is that now what i've been able to do just to kind of finish off that particular story is i've mm -hmm. i've found that when i'm dealing with clients the success, the, the reason I walk outside their house or when they left the office, I jump up and down and go, woo, is I've actually achieved something for them to benefit from. Like the, suddenly they've been able to um, go and buy the second home, buy, buy the yacht in the med that they've always dreamed of or go on a big cruise. And and I get so excited for them, you know. I had I had a kind of day, and and uh, one one of the one of the uh, spouses is quite poorly, has quite a serious illness, and um, she's incredibly strong, and they're a lovely couple. They've been clients of mine for near on 15, 16 years now, and 
And I was I was so excited about the fact that they've loved starting when they retired doing these cruises and hadn't been doing it for several years because of the pandemic and also and they've got a couple of cruises lined up and now we we've spent twenty minutes talking about the detail of these two cruises. You know, <laughs> this isn't wealth management. This is very. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so excited about this and they and and they come and they go. This is it. Almost feels like we sh- you know that you, you want to come with us. I went no, actually, I'm not somebody who would actually probably enjoy being on a boat for, you know, for 14 days. I think it would, you know, I'd probably have to dive off it a couple of times. I just, it'd find it too restrictive. But sure. I'm so excited for you that actually that's how it's coming across. And mm. that, that emotional attachment. Now, I think when it comes to business, I, you came back to a point with um, about, you know, uh, looking at how people kind of work and how they start off. We had a conversation about you know, the starter and the manager. Mm. And I think one of the big perspectives is that if you get a good investor, you know, and um, they don't necessarily need to be an angel investor, but someone who backs you, that investor doesn't need to invest just money, but they need to invest other skill sets and abilities they can bring with them. And I always say to anybody going out trying to find money as investors, don't just go to the first person who offers you the pounds and pence or the dollars. You know, don't just chase the dollar, chase the person as well. Work with the people that you think, you know, often the people that choose the right, in the go out to the dragon's den, they choose, you know, a particular dragon's because they say, actually, I like that dragon. That's somebody I really want in my business. Actually, the money has disappeared into the back view. They've kind of, they've got the money they feel now. And often they don't even need the money. They actually are just there to get the dragon on board because that emotional journey they'll be able to attach them to. So the whole point I'm going to hear is that when you're in that startup process and you're getting, you know, you're bringing that investor is not just somebody who's going to put a bank balance in front of you, but get someone who can say to you, okay, your skill set, your abilities are this. You need to go and find someone like this now. You need to go and find someone like that and what you do. And then get to also the point where they need to say to you, actually, you need to step back from this business now. You know, I, I am a investor with you. You've invested love, time and maybe a bit of your money. I've invested also a lot of my money, a good chunk of my time. And actually now my love for this business has grown, you know, and not be scared to use the word love. You know, you should love what you do. And I think that's really important and love the people you work with. And I think if that becomes that kind of... If, if, if you have that kind of relationship whereby then the investor can turn around and say, look, you need now to find somebody who can drive this business forward for you. The, the entrepreneur needs to have that ability to also say, you know, this isn't a personal kind of um, a negative uh, reaction. It's not a, a negative comment. This is not a negative decision to be made. This is going to also make me, it might make me more money, but it will make my business grow. You know, you, you can see how people become so attached to their businesses and love them so much. And even the bigger ones, you know, if even it's interesting when you sometimes listen to someone like Bill Gates talking about Microsoft, you still have that little that little chink of light of seeing him as a young man in his garage still. It's still mm. there. It's very faint now because of the size of the business and the people that have driven it forward. And so, but it's still there. And ultimately, it will never go. Even Steve Jobs, you know, may he rest in peace, you know. Um, and all the, the trauma that we went through with with Apple and going and up there and being kicked out back in whatever you know the success that came from that, even though he's gone, you can still see that light shines for him. You know, you know, and I'm, I'm not trying to kind of create some kind of pseudo religious factor. Right. Please excuse me, but I think that's what emotion and and you know, and, and that actually is a good point maybe Errol, because it yeah. kind of leans back into what I call the, the morality perspective as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and maybe that's something we could touch on. Yeah. Yes, I think that's really interesting. Uh, again, uh, I've said that quite a few times already, but I mean, um, <laughs> the <laughs> but uh, you know, you mentioned light. You mentioned this kind of even even the fact that you mentioned kind of the religious implication of the of the metaphor you're using. I think tells us something, which mm. is that you know, culture matters, right? And and, and, mm-hmm. and um, you know, the entrepreneur is not exclusively, I think the entrepreneur is probably, well, maybe I don't want to be too uh, binary about this, but maybe it's like the antithesis of an institution, but I don't mm-hmm. want to be binary about it, but or linear about it, really. But, you know, it, it's not, it's not, it, it's kind of a culture creator, an entrepreneur. Because a business is kind of a little uh, uh, system where the culture is being created, and and the the entrepreneur has to sort of project that light that you still see in in many of the mm. uh, entrepreneurs who have now grown massive businesses. So I mean, it's interesting that um, re- re- you know religion was brought up and, and almost spirituality and 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 sort of a transcendent <laughs> higher purpose in in what's going on. Mm. And I think maybe that links to meaning making slightly as well. You know, it uh, um, when you and and you know you mentioned 1970s and the kind of aggressive zero sum game approach of many of the mm. businessmen at that time. You know I think that that um, is probably coming from a slightly 
insecure position of ag aggression needs you know we need to be piercing and aggressive rather mm. than uh cooperative mm. um and and, yeah. uh, and relationship oriented right again it comes back to this idea of you know the, mm -hmm. the whole is greater than the sum of its parts instead of thinking about one individual thing maybe we can think about things slightly more holistically and appreciate that there are feedback loops that occur much like in the environment they can be negative they can mm -hmm. be positive mm -hmm. right um so we can learn a little bit maybe from environmental scientists <laughs> about how to approach business there yes. um so that, that's just that's one sort of thing uh that the positive mind but also maybe attachment here you mentioned attachment which is great you know in the same way that in personal relationships you know we talked about this as well you can have sort of codependent relationships where it's mm -hmm. it's, it's not healthy for the individuals mm -hmm. involved i think entrepreneurs and their businesses can become very similar to that right mm -hmm. it's, it's such mm -hmm. a strong attachment such a holding tight not being able to let go not mm -hmm. being able to let others into it mm -hmm. that um you know i wonder then is that a you know that again you, you mentioned that sometimes managers need to come in and and, and uh, take mm -hmm. over and sometimes the entrepreneur is willing and and, and wise enough to let go um mm -hmm. To let it grow and growing is not just about money it's also about i think um the growth of the of of, of the operations and, and, mm. and what, it, what it's there to do um so yeah i mean i, I think i sorry I, I just sort of went off a, a little bit there because yeah. we weren't very uh sort of <laughs> yeah no, 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 it's, it's, it's really it's really broken up because it kind of yeah. brings in a little bit of a kind of a you know uh, an understanding around the and this link does link back to the title of the subject um so i'm not drifting out too much hopefully but no, no, around no. Um, how in a business you know um often you know the product or service is a great focus from day one you know we are going to do this and that's how we're going to do it and we're going to solve all these customers problems or, or we're going to provide a fantastic service that they don't know they need yet or they do need you know we and it's and and as the excitement is driven by that but actually one of the great things about entrepreneurs often also, and I think I've seen this in, as, as I've kind of grown up as a young entrepreneur, I don't think I realized it as a uh, not so young entrepreneur, slightly older entrepreneur, you know, and, and where I've been involved with so many businesses, what I've actually started to recognize, actually, it's about the people as well. And one of the most exciting things about actually growing a business is getting more and more people on board and building a team and seeing that culture develop. And I know the cascade uh, approach of kind of stuff falling down from the top and you know if you you know that's one of the things that often scares entrepreneurs is you know you bring in a ceo to manage your business for and you go oh my gosh they're gonna have a massive culture impact but actually do you know what that's fine you know you, you can still see how that works you can still attract the right kind of person into that and in fact you know you don't ever recruit in your own image you recruit the person you need that compliments you you know and i've always seeked businesses where i go in i'm not like that person if i if i met someone you know if i had my twin i don't have a twin brother by the way if i did have a twin brother and i'm in business we wouldn't never get anything done you know mm -hmm. <laughs> the energy would be fantastic but it wouldn't wouldn't actually be productive yeah. you know and in fact you know the people i'm in business with are people who do turn around and who sometimes you know lasso me back down to the ground saying we need to do this and i'm going oh yeah sorry and we're going to do that, you know, and that's a bit boring, but we've got to do it. And then I'm likewise saying to them, your head's so far buried underground trying to do this. Let's go and get this sorted. You know, and mm. I think business needs to develop that. And one 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 topic that leads into which I think is uh, maybe a change from the from the 1970s as well. And it's been developed very much through um you know, the Silicon Valley approach in terms of the entrepreneurial focus is accepting failure and learning from it. And I think this is a really interesting factor around about what attracts entrepreneurs into great ideas. They can now accept that the original idea they have isn't necessarily going to be the idea they're going to end up with. Yeah. We talk about talk about pivoting. We talk about um, change management. We talk about kind of cultural capital and cultural development around that. And I think these are really big factors that um, that if recognised early enough can be developed to make sure that the business is actually recognizing the value in that early on and isn't something that it just comes as a result of them working hard, shall we say, you know, loose term. And I think accepting those failures, those little failures that, you know, every day some things go wrong, some things happen and learning from that is such an attractive way for entrepreneurs to also understand that, you know, if I'm starting a business and I do something wrong or I upset a customer or I do something wrong in the business to say, you go, okay, well, let's try and not make that same mistake again. And in fact, what do we learn from that? You know, mm -hmm. you learn more from your failures than from your your successes and victories in some ways. Because actually, if you do something really well and it's successful, you kind of probably haven't thought about what you've done. You just focus on the success. Um, one would like to think that somebody else has, and maybe you do then do that kind of 360 or 180 focus back and you can see where the success has been. But often the greatest successes aren't necessarily because people have had just a constant success, you know, 
you know, look look how the space race developed, you know, oh. through the 60s and 70s, you know. I mean, and, and how many failures and failings happened on that. Even in recent years, you know, looking at some of the kind of well-known uh, space entrepreneurs we have in our uh, midst these days, you know, it's not all about this. They're driven through pushing for failure, pushing, mm. you know, we call it stress testing or whatever, but pushing for failure so that actually from that, they have much better success. And I think that's a really important perspective. Is that attractive to an entrepreneur? That's a question I'll leave hanging there, I think, because I think entrepreneurs still struggle with it a little bit sometimes because they say if they, uh, if it's, if they fail, that sometimes it's not necessarily because of, you know, a, you know, let me rephrase it. Um, it, it are they going to be a successful entrepreneur if they fail too much or if they fail at all? You know, mm. and that, that's part of the psyche, maybe. I don't know. That's very, yeah. I mean, that's that's quite rather evocative for me because I think that's something that I even struggle with sometimes. Is, well, very often probably actually is is a sense of perfectionism or this kind mm. of sense. Of, maybe it's a fear. Actually, I think it's, mm. it, fundamentally it's a deep fear, um, and it's a stress response. You know, I, I wonder. It makes me think about zoning out, um, which is I was I was recently reading something about ADHD in children, but it's very relevant mm. I think, for entrepreneurs. Which is, mm. you know, um, often it's. Uh, due to a stress in their environment, right? You can either fight, flight, ask for help. And if those are options aren't there, well, then what you can do to protect yourself is to zone out, to zone, zone, you know, allow yourself to kind of move away from the stress. And I wonder then if an entrepreneur, the, and I'm talking maybe about the risk here for an entrepreneur, that you're under this stress, this kind of maybe even self-perceived, uh, self-imposed sense of failure, uh, the, the, the ability to zone out, to maintain an identity that has mm. been created which is so sensitive, of course, right? Mm -hmm. I'm an entrepreneur. I've created this. I'm proud of this. You, you attach so much. You, again, it comes back to attachment. You attach so much of yourself and your identity to it that it's, it's impossible to think about mm -hmm. anything else. And you end mm -hmm. up zoning out, which, mm -hmm. which, which in turn is a stress uh, for, the, yeah. for the business, right? Yeah. Right? So, uh, and, 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 and maybe that leads to, you know, then you start having very hard conversations with your investors or with your customers and, and you're going to defend that identity at all costs, right? mm -hmm. even, if you're, even if the business is, you've zoned out from the business long ago because mm -hmm. of the stress of the, the potential failure. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, you know, partly I'm reflecting on myself here as well. Maybe I can learn something. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, thank that's you. For, that's healthy. But yeah, that's thank, healthy. <laughs> thank you. For and and, and yeah. do you know what? I think, Errol, there are times where you have to stand up and defend what you believe in, mm. even if you are being challenged to it. Um, you know, I, I think it's one of those kind of focuses that um, has been picked up more and more refreshingly from people, understanding that, you know, if, if it's a blind kind of like, I'm just going to do what I'm doing, I'm a bulldozer, you know, and that's it. I, the, people find that hard, even if they're right, actually, sometimes they find it hard. What actually this is about is, I think you're right. I think that there needs to be, uh, there needs to be a point where you also need to be able to step back and say, let me just consider about this. You know, I still want to be right, but I need to consider this. I think that's really important. Mm. And you, you bring up a really interesting point here. So, I mean, again, it's a, it's a slight little kind of side alley to the conversation, but around this zoning out. And I recognized over time, um, I, I actually live with stress. I like stress. I like good stress. I think there's good stress and there's bad stress. And I think, you know, entrepreneurs gain that really quickly. It's something they start to pick up with because, you know, there are days, you know, there are nights I don't sleep because I'm worried about something. And it's not bad worries because I, I, I need to get this done. And we have this kind of interesting kind of focus that sometimes, and again, I have this uh, a slightly kind of hypothetical analogy of that I'm one of these people that um, I, have, I have many spinning plates. You know, the spinning plates on the poles, you know. I have many spinning plates and I juggle as well. So you know, I'm a spinning plate juggler, which yeah. sounds almost impossible, but it means sometimes, you know, to keep all those plates spinning and juggling at the same time, is really hard and things fall out, things do drop or things start to wobble. And it becomes very, very frustrating sometimes. And and sometimes I you're absolutely right as an entrepreneur and businesses, I find the way I do it is I almost start to block, I, I mm -hmm. zone out. And what happens is I kind of find myself going, and if you do it for more than a few minutes, shall I say, especially if you do it over several days or several weeks, what happens is nothing gets done. Mm -hmm. So you start to back away from everything because mm -hmm. you're saying, oh my gosh, and 99% of this stuff is not a problem. You know, but it's that one thing. So what I've learned to do over time is, you know, pad and paper is great, you know, always helpful, you know, old fashioned style or whatever you want to do. It. But to sit down and you kind of process this stuff through. And sometimes it's a case of saying, well, actually, um, there's something that's worrying me. What is it? What is it? What is it? Right. I now found this. Hmm. 
let's go and do it. Sometimes, and for me, it's like the kind of, you know, the difficult email or, or the difficult conversation. And you go, right, what you need to do is almost take, again, you know, take, the, take, take almost take your brain out in some way, but take the emotions out and yeah. say, it's going to go and do it. Because what you don't realize is the person on the other end is not thinking the same way as you. They're not thinking the same process. This is all psychometric up here. It's all the yeah. psychological approach to where you are with this. And what you need to do is just take yourself out of this and say, let's just go and do this one problem. And then everything suddenly, it's like someone, it's like being in a fog and the sun burns through and everything lifts. And you're going to go, oh, hang on. And then you look back at it. And I, I really recommend people do this. If you find you get points of stress in your life or things that are just really what I call blockers is hit it hard. Go in, even if it's not the best way of doing it. Go and, mm -hmm. go and just take, say, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to panic about it. I'm not going to be concerned about it. I'm not going to fear failure. And I, I see Maria's point about his change of language around failure, not call it failure. I think that's possibly one way of doing it is we could try and say, do we change the word? But I'm also a great believer. It is what it is. Just, just, just live with it and learn from it. My point of view, I think, you know, just try and say it's not necessarily a bad thing. We can have good failure. But if you can do that, what happens is things become a lot easier, you know. And I find sometimes there's actually nothing stopping me from doing stuff. It's just up here, me kind of worrying about little things. And it's a case of like, let's just take my head out of this. Let's just try and see if we can get back on track with this. Now, I've learned this. So how then you can translate that to kind of entrepreneurs that I'm investing with or people I'm working with is the real important part because it, it, this is really hard to explain. And in fact, the best time to do it is not whether they're in there. If, it, if they're in that point and the fog is down, you become part of that fog. And, you know, in this car, and they can't hear you. So you yep. need to say how things go. Things are going great. Let's talk about how you deal with problem solving or blockers Let's yep. see and, and get, kind of work that way. Or how do you cope with failure? And then go, oh, well, failure, failure is not. If they're not failing at that point, it's a much easier conversation to have. And then give them the permission. And I think it's, it's not, it's, it's not something Maria picked up in her comment, but actually I think it's something I'm hearing more and more. Is give them the permission to go and fail. Give them the permission to say, this is, this is part of the process of building and running a business. And actually, do you know what? It's part of the attractiveness to me because actually I know that when we fail in something, it really gives us a chance to analyze and understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Something jumps, you know, I, I'm just also aware of the time. I think we have five minutes. So I also, please, Maria, thank you for sharing. I, I, I very much um, uh, encourage everybody, you know, in, in who's, who's watching now. Uh, so Ragnar and Maria <laughs> to please uh, do share. Um, do share any thoughts that you have but just think it back to the kind of topic uh um more formally let's say it's it's this has all been very relevant and one way that we can see that is you know mm. those who are those who are um prone to this zoning out phenomenon mm. that we've just described and unpacked mm. slightly together um and that i've learned a lot from so thank you um i hope others can say the same uh <laughs> maybe maybe we can learn you know we can learn about what attracts entrepreneurs rather than the idea attracting the entrepreneur. It's, it's, it's the entrepreneur that in some ways attracts the idea, <laughs> which is yeah, you know, yeah. it's a very, maybe, you know, it's, a, it's a, maybe a bit of a dangerous statement to make in terms of any like, you know, metaphysical claims about attracting ideas. But I, I would say it's, it's a, it's a, it's an emotional and psychological position here mm -hmm. about, um, I am prone to not failing, which means that I am successful at things I've done. I have a track record of success, which is probably going to make you more likely to, to be a successful entrepreneur to some extent mm. until you hit these blocks that you just described. Mm. And that's where um, maybe we can, we can ask, you know, what attracts people to being on, uh, what attracts entrepreneurs to solving certain problems or solving certain ideas? It may well be something that you need to explore within. Uh, mm. and, and, and that's both for the management of the actual mm. venture once it started, but also about what you are being attracted to, maybe mm. to ask the questions of where those attractions are coming from and where they're rooted. So, I mean, I think, I think that was all incredibly relevant to the, proposition mm -hmm. and, and and i found i found it very interesting um i wonder uh, if i've missed any questions or any comments uh, I so. I'm just looking. Uh, while yeah. you're looking at um, i'll come back there's a little kind of tip that comes from this um many people don't know about something called parkinson's law um it was kind of uh derived from a a, a gentleman called c northcote parkinson who was an, an author um who I kind of enjoyed as a child, his, some of his, his books he wrote, but also as adult, he's done some really interesting books, kind of uh, in-laws and outlaws. And this very, again, about kind of emotional intelligence and perspectives. And what was interesting, he's quite a humorous writer, but he came up with something called Parkinson's Law, whereby if you go to someone and get a job done somebody, if you give them a week to do it, they'll take a week to do it. Mm -hmm. If you say, I need it done by 4 p.m. today, they'll do it by 4 p.m., by 4 p.m., but they'll get on with it. And often the job is better done in that shorter time frame. 
Yeah. And it's about kind of understanding. So the, the reason I said that is that I think it's about people understanding that you need to um, uh, kind of be realistic about those goals. And sometimes actually being kind of pressurized is a great idea to do it. But also actually build into the acceptance around little failures, you know, almost kind of accept it. And I have the reason I mentioned the possible, these, these kind of disjoint because I have one of my weaknesses happy to admit it, is that often I'll say, okay, this is something I need to do. I've got to next Friday. So I'll do it before Friday. Definitely. Definitely before Friday. Mm. Definitely. I'll do it for Friday. It's, it's only Monday today. I've got all week. To, Tuesday comes. It's Friday. I've got something to do Tuesday. I wait for Wednesday. I want to get on with that. I'll start it. And then it gets to Friday morning. And I go, I better do it now. You know, so, so Parkinson's law applies. It's it's a it's a uh, it's a state of mind, and it, it's not it's quite common amongst kind of human beh- behavioral science in that sense. So, what is interesting here is that I often use this in a retrospective way to kind of create almost what I call little failures by actually saying, actually, I have learned from the fact that I should have done this then, and so you, you kind of almost allow yourself that little failure. Um, mm-hmm. As long as it doesn't affect anybody else, that's the key thing, or affect your business long term. But you know, build in something that allows you to learn from that. And I think because when you learn to fail, so I'm not saying go and please do this as a regular perspective, actually, because this is a really bad piece of advice, isn't it? <laughs> when you've learned to kind of fail, you actually learn to cope with that and how to then recover from that. And I think that's the key thing here. It's about then also not just learning to fail, not just getting permission to fail. It's not just learning how that becomes part of the attractiveness, but also it learns about actually how that becomes part of the resolution, becomes part of your uh, toolkit, becomes part of your ability to be a good entrepreneur. Mm. I think that's really, really important. Yeah, very much so. Uh, and the failure uh, last, I mean, I'm, I, we've, we've overrun. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so, uh, I'm sure we could overrun far, far more. Uh, but I think that's a great way to actually end it is, is go, go out and fail. <laughs> that's a great way to end it. <laughs> Maybe accept, have permission to fail, but, but don't do it twice, yeah? Uh, I think yeah. the whole comment is, you know, fail, f- failing first is, is learning. So to fail a second time is, you know, is, is foolishness. So uh, let's just make sure we've got that in line. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. As, as, as a caveat, I remember we discussed it, prospect theory as well. You know, it comes back, the, neg- the negatives are slightly more uh, painful than the positives. And mm-hmm. so by, by, by doing that, hopefully you get a quite a physical reaction to the failure and you learn pretty quickly. And, mm-hmm. and so that's the, that's the beauty is to listen, is to yes. listen to yourself, right? Yeah. No. Wonderful, wonderful. Yep. That's been thank great. You, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, I, a, I learned a lot, so I appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. I say thank you, Ragnar and Maria, obviously for staying on this and being, you know, and they obviously enjoyed the conversation as well. Um, yeah. You know, please thank reach you. out to um, either myself, or Eric, if you, if you need to. I'm always happy to have conversations and chats with people. I'm a very uh, chatty person, as Errol knows. Um, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, thank you. You know, uh, enjoy the rest of the day, and uh, thank you, Errol, for you know leading this conversation and, and the preparation work you've done with us. I know from being a moderator myself this is not the easiest job and uh but uh i hope i've made it uh an enjoyable and interesting one i'm 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 indebted and grateful to you thank you <laughs> my pleasure thank you take care bye-bye